You, can, you know, when we talk about in the flesh, we're saying in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. Even when you see Jesus and it's like, okay, Jesus, follow me. And then you say, okay, I'll do that in my own strength. Jesus is saying, follow you, but he's not, in one way he's saying, follow me, but only in my strength. I'm, it's actually better that way, because he's basically saying, you, don't need to, you won't need to do this alone, Peter. I'll be with you every step of the way. I'll walk with you. I'll give you the strength. I'll give you all the help that you need. And that's how God wants it. But Peter wants to do it himself. And it says, you were also with the Nazarene Jesus, but he denied it. He says, I don't, un- I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went into the entryway. So somebody says, you're with Jesus. And I think it's like, okay, I've been challenged. You feel like that. Like, okay, I've been challenged. I'm in a trial, you know. And he doesn't outright, well, he does deny him because he says he denies him three times. But there's a scale of this denial that comes in. But first of all, he says, I don't know, understand what you're talking about. He's like, you know, I don't know anything about this. You know, you feel like that. It's like you're walking with Jesus. I, you know, I thought I knew what it would be like, but I, I, I begin to don't know. And, and all of a sudden, she, she says, you are also with the Nazarene Jesus. And, and you start to not know and experience that relationship like you should be. And it says, when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. So she challenges him to his face. And then she says to everybody else, he's one of them. Peter is one of them. Isn't this the time for Peter to shine? Isn't like, you know, when you, you know, I know what it's about, Jesus, and it's my time to shine now. I'm going to say, yes, I'm with him. I'm going to die with you, Jesus. And you can't, isn't it? And God knows that. God knows, and God loves you. God's not angry with you. God's not against you. He knows that. He knows how weak you are in the flesh. That's why Jesus has to go to the cross. And he says, again, he denied it. And again, he just denies it, isn't it? He says, this fellow is one of them. He's just denying it. No, I'm, I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. I'm not one of these disciples. I can't handle it. You know, you're thinking, I'm not, I'm, you're being Peter right now. You're thinking, I'll never do that. <laughs> you're like, how can you do that? You've got to think, this is a denial moment. You're not doing it right now, but it's, it's that moment, isn't it? You see, sometimes when we go into sin and we go into temptation, that's a denial moment, isn't it? Remember when David slept with Bathsheba and, and the prophet said, hey, you despise the Lord at that moment. It was a denial, wasn't it? We do things and it becomes a denial. You know, like we're in the church right now, we're saying, I'll never do that. But actually, this is, this is his denial moment. Put, your, put your, uh, your feet in his shoes right now. And it says, after, the, after a, a little while, so the, the little girl gives it a little bit of a moment. It says, after a little while, those standing near said to Peter. So now the people, she said to them, he's one of them. And now the people... All the people around are starting to say, surely, you know, they're like, they're com- they're com- they know who he is. They've seen Peter. You are one of them. Sometimes when you go into sin and you, and you go to that wrong place, isn't it? people are looking for you. Don't you go to church? Aren't you, aren't you a believer? Aren't you a trusting? I've seen believers that go the, the wrong way in the world and the people in the world are saying, aren't you a believer? Aren't you a Christian? Aren't you uh, somebody that's trusting in Jesus? Why are you here? You know, praise God, some people are going there, they are evangelizing, but some people are not evangelizing. And they're in the wrong place. And it's, it's denial, I'll never do that, Lord. And it says, and this is the heartbreak, is that this, is what I, this is when Peter's heart begins to break, because the healing of his heart was about being connected with Christ. The healing of your heart is being restored to God, and it's his love, and you see, only God can heal your heart. And it's part of the, never forget, it's part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Think of that claim. I have come to heal the brokenhearted. He said it out of his mouth. He read it from the scriptures in the temple, from the scriptures that were written by the word of God. I have come to heal the brokenhearted. And Peter is going to be that candidate. He was always a candidate for that, but he's going to be that candidate because he says, he began to call down curses on himself. You ever been like that? I am... I am wrong, I am filthy, I am disgusting, I can never make it. I, I can, I, I, I'm, I'm in totally the wrong place, a curse. It's probably more extreme than that. Can you imagine calling down a curse? Peter, Jesus says, isn't it, you had that revelation that um, man has not revealed to you but Father in heaven has revealed it to you and he's beginning to call down curses on his third denial. And you do that when you fail, isn't it? 
You do that. I, this will never get better. This will never heal. My heart will never heal. My, the, my future will never be restored. I will never know God the way that I should know God. I will never have the future that God has told me that I will have. I will never be able to come close to him again. A curse. I'm part of, I'm part of the unclean. I'm part of the unbeliever. I'm part of those who are perishing, isn't it? That's the curse, isn't it? And he calls that down himself. And I think as he's calling that down, he's breaking his heart. Every time he's calling that down, he's breaking his heart. And the problem is because he said, I can do this in my own strength. I can follow you in my own strength. And when he fails and when you fall into sin and you think, oh, it's going to take something more than my own strength. Because he gives his best strength. Remember, he's going to give everything. He's emphatic. I will follow you. I will read the word like I should read it. I will pray like I should read it. I will love my family members like I should love them. I will not do this. And all of a sudden, it is going from that to curses, isn't it? And he's calling these curses down on them. And he began to go, call down the curses. And then his denial becomes even more straight-lined. He says, I do not know this man you're talking about. Think of that. Peter who writes one Peter and two Peter and preaches in the book of Acts, is his denial. Like, I don't know this man that you are talking about. How many of you have felt like that and you feel, I, I don't know him. I, I, I'm, you know, if, it, I failed now, God. And he's in, he's in failure territory. And it says, immediately the rooster crowed. Jesus says, but you'll, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times Peter. He denies on the third time and all of a sudden the rooster crows. And you feel like that, isn't it? His words come true in my life. Think about when that rooster crows. You know, I don't, we don't hear much roosters around here, but you, you know, it's got that squawk, isn't it? And it's like the word of God is just confirming. You might have felt like that. The word of God is confirming what I'm saying about myself. The word of God is confirming this failure. That I'll never change. I'll never be part of God's kingdom. I'll never be able to have a future in God. It's all done now. It's all gone. And it says, Then Peter remembered the word. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. The, because it already crowed the first time. This is the second time. Fulfilling what Jesus said. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus has spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he, this, is the, this, is the, this is the bit that breaks your heart. And he broke down and he wept. I'm, I, I, I'm not, I know you're not weeping right now, but I know some of you are. I know some of you, and you're failure, you're breaking down and weeping. It's not that you don't want to follow God. You want to follow God. You want to follow Jesus, but you've, you've failed, and it's brought you to this place. And, you know, it just, and that's it. You know, chapter 14 ends with that. In chapter 15, you go in a whole different scene. And all you hear, the last of Peter at that moment, there's going to be another bit of Peter, is he's just, he's broke down and he's wept. How many feel like that? I've just, I have got nothing more to say. He's not boast, boasting. He's, he's just, he, you know, broken hearted. I'm broke down. You ever, you ever been to that place where you've just broken down? And it's to do with the things of God. It's to do with your, the future. It's to do with the present. It's to do with all the things that God is speaking to you. And you thought this hope was going to be the hope that gets you out. This is going to be the very thing. And all of a sudden, the next minute he's going to see is, in that sense, it was Jesus on the cross. And he breaks, he breaks down and, and weeps. And that's where you are, isn't it? If you're to be honest, when it comes to doing things in your own strength, when it comes to, to being the Christian that you wanted to be, you wanted to be, the, you know, he wanted to be the follower that he wanted to be with Jesus and, and he couldn't make it. And it says there, and, and what he's saying, he's saying like this, he's like, I thought that I would be better at following you. You ever felt like that? I thought that I was going to be better at following you. I saw other people fail, Lord. I saw them fail. I saw them get wounded. And I thought to myself, I would be better at following you than what I am. You ever feel like that? And Because he, he goes, I will, I will follow you. And then he denied, isn't it? And he's left with the denial. And, how, and, how do you, and so how do you marry these two verses? It, Isaiah 61, isn't it? The spirit of the, Jesus comes and says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You know, because you've got these promises and you've got your failure. And you think, but the word of God must come true, isn't it? He's going to heal the brokenhearted. What about Peter's broken heart? What about this man's failure's broken heart? And so how do you marry these two verses, isn't it? Is it past for you now or is it going to be the future? Praise God, it's going to be the future. 
The, your failure is actually going to be your beginning. When you've, you've stopped in your own strength and you say, right, I cannot do this. I can't even keep myself clean. I can't even change myself. I can't change my attitude. I can't do any of that. I want to change my attitude. Paul says that I love, I delight in the law of God with all my heart, but I just can't do it. I just don't have the strength to do what he's asking me to do. And God is saying, Jesus is saying he's come to heal the brokenhearted. And you see that in John chapter 21 as we close with this, this story here. And you think, you failed. How is Jesus going to restore you? Because it's not the end for Peter. God is going to restore you. And this is how he's going to restore you. Because he's going to, you know, to heal your heart, you can't just say your heart is healed and all of a sudden, like, all of, you know, everything's in place. Because you, the part of your broken heart was, it was something you said. It was about your past. It's something you did. You know, there's, there's a history to it. There was, there, was, there was things that were recorded. And God knows that he's dealing with that. Um, and the amazing thing is, you see in verse 12 and 21, what happens there is Peter has gone back fishing. So after Jesus died, Peter's gone back fishing, and he says, like, you know, almost like he's given up. And then Jesus, the risen Jesus, comes to meet him while he's fishing. In his, in his daytime job, basically. You know, Peter, you're called um, to, to preach the, the Gospels ultimately to the Jews eventually. He'd be preaching um, and all of a sudden, he's going back fishing after the risen Christ. And in his daytime job, the risen Christ appears to him, isn't it? And the disciples. And they, they go, if you've read the story, basically, they, they're fishing. They can't catch anything. They can't catch anything. Jesus speaks to them, and then they begin to catch again. The miracle comes back. The, the word of God comes back. And that's what he will do when he starts to heal your heart. You think he's never going to speak to you again. You think he's never going to turn up. He's going to turn up in your life, and he's going to begin to speak to you, and you're just going to listen to his word again, and the miracle will start taking place. You've been, you know, they were fishing. After Jesus died, they went back fishing. They basically said, following Jesus is too much. It's too difficult. I'm going to go back to my old job. And they tried to fish, and they can't catch fish all night. And then all of a sudden, Jesus turns up, and then they start to catch fish. And it's, it's symbolic, isn't it? It's saying you, you can't do it in your own strength. No matter how much you try, you can fish all night. You can try and change your temper with all the strength. You can take all the strength. I will not get angry. I will not be tempered. I will. And all of a sudden, you explode, isn't it? I will not be like this. I will not be like this. And all of a sudden, it goes wrong. I will not be like this. I will not be like this. And they're like that. We'll catch fish. We'll catch fish. And these are experienced fishermen. They're putting the, the net in. They can't catch it. And miraculously, Jesus turns up and he begins to speak to them. And he tells them, put the, I think, the net on the right-hand side. And they put the net down, and then they catch the fish. And that's what Jesus do. He'll just begin to show up in your life, in his power, and he'll begin to speak to you. and say, listen to my word, and do what I'm asking you, and you'll find that it will change. And Peter's so excited that he, he jumps out, jumps out the boat and swims to Jesus. Because you thought, he's never going to speak to me again. He's never going, and the first thing he, do you know what's amazing? The first thing he starts speaking to you and a miracle happens in your life. Think that you've failed him, you've denied him, and he starts speaking to you and a miracle takes place. It's starting to build up now. It's like, whoa, I didn't even think he was going to talk to me. I thought he would talk to me in some sort of mundane, really like low-key, dark environment, isn't it? Some sort of eerie, you know, spitting down at you sort of environment. The first thing he shows up and there's a miracle. It's like, whoa, I, I, I recognize these miracles. I recognize when the word of God has spoken to me. I recognize whose voice this is. Because the Bible says he was at the side, but they can't even recognize him. But when they see the miracles, when they see the word of God, and when God does something in your life that only God can do, that only Jesus can do, you say, this is God. And Peter's like, you know, last time Peter's crying, last time Peter's weeping, that's the last you see. Now you see Peter jumping out the boat and swimming towards, because he knows it's Jesus. And Jesus says, come and have breakfast. Come, think about it. You, the last time you saw was you denied him, your savior is getting beaten, and you've denied him at the most critical hour, and then the next time you, you've got him, he's, having, he's, he's made breakfast. And the breakfast was amazing, trust me. The fish that he put on was amazing. And so Jesus, he creates this warm environment, isn't it? He, he's going to start healing your heart in a warm, loving environment. I don't want to help you. You cannot have your heart healed in a big shout and screaming environment, can you? Have you ever been in a big shout and scream? I'll heal your heart. Be better. Do more. Stop thinking like that. Can't do it, can you? 
What happens if you, in the morning, after you do that, the, the breakfast is there and it's smelling beautiful? And Jesus has spoken, he's, you know, he, he started to bring a miracle and a bountiful harvest, as it were, coming into your life. You see, and the love, you know, what, what's, you see, sometimes the love is created by the environment. You know, Jesus could have spoke to him about the breakfast, but he made the breakfast. He said, come and have breakfast with me. He's saying that to you. I, I, you think about it. In your failure, who wants to go and have breakfast, isn't it? After I've, I've wronged you, who wants to go and have this, you know, because you feel you don't, you, don't, you don't feel worthy for it. But that's, what he, that's the setting, that's the environment he's put there. And he says, come and have breakfast with me. And I think as they're sitting down, um, as we see it, let's read here. Come and have breakfast with me, in verse 12. None of the disciples dare ask him who you are. They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples as he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to him, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Okay, so you get this moment, and, I, and as he, they're relaxing, Jesus begins to speak to him. And this is where the healing is going to come. You see, your healing has to do with knowing your love, God restoring the promises of God back in your life, restoring the plan that he has for your life, and, and, and then you, he will give you the, all the power and the strength you to be able to fulfill that. And Peter is actually going to get his heart healed because he's going to learn to rely and trust in the Lord for all the provision that he needs. And it will bring a, a, this healing to his heart. And it says there in verse 15, Jesus is going to start asking him three questions. And it says, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon Peter, this is Peter, because he's called Simon Peter. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Isn't the purpose is getting restored. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said, take care of my sheep. So again, there's the love. Do you, do you love me? Yes, okay, take care of my sheep. We've spoken about the love, Peter. The purpose is restored. We've spoken about the love, Peter. The, 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 the calling of God in your life is restored. And then the third time, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? What is interesting about the third time, isn't it? Because Peter denies three times. And three times, Jesus is going to speak about love, and he's going to speak about restoration. And he says this, take care of my sheep. The f um, yeah, it says, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. And this is where the healing comes in. Because you ask three times, Peter gets hurt when he asks the third time. Why? Because that's the place of denial. That is the place of denial. That is the place of, of the pain, isn't it? That's the source, of, source of, of the pain. If Peter had not denied him, Peter would not be feeling pain about him asking three times. He was asking three times, it doesn't matter. He remembers, isn't it? And what God, what God is saying to you, what God needs to do, God needs to get the love of God in the same place where the pain is. He needs to get the, that's where he needs to get the love of God. He needs to get, and he needs to get the promise of God in the same place where you're, you've got the pain and the hurt and the place of failure. The place where you failed, the place where you thought it was all over, God saying it's not over. Jesus saying it's not over. You know, because what's the point of having God's love up here but your pain is all down here? What's the point of having God's future and plan, Jesus' future and plan, Jesus' success for your life as it were, in, in the calling that he has for you, but your, your failure is all down here. And he asked three times because he said, I need to get that love right where it hurts. I need to, you know, how, how can you heal a broken heart unless you get to the heart? You know, how can you heal that heart until you get to where it hurts, to get where the pain was, to get to where it went wrong? And God speaks into where it went wrong. God speaks into where you failed and you've done it in your own strength. See, the problem is you've done it in your own strength. And God said, I'm going to turn your life around, Peter, because you're going to do things in my strength and you're going to glorify me with, with your life. And he, Jesus even says that. After he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then he says, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. 
That's Peter saying, I will follow you. I will go where I wanted. He, he wasn't actually able to go where he, to follow Christ. But he says this, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Because Peter, one of the disciples, got martyred. He was killed for his faith. But through being killed, he, he glorified God. And Jesus said, I will get you to the way, place that you want it to be, where you're called to be. I will get you to the place where I've called you to be. I will get you to a place that you glorify me. And it won't because you did it. It won't because you can boast and say, I did it. You failed. You, you, your last moment was failure. And God said, I'll, I'll take over now. I'll take over from here. I'll begin to speak to you. I'll begin to lead you. And anytime you start saying, well, I can do it in my own strength, Peter's going to say, no, I can't. Slap in the forehead. I can't do it in my own strength. I'm going to trust the Lord. He's going to lead me. And he's, he's going to help me. And he, he bring, and he says there, right at the last bit there, it says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he says this word, which is amazing. Then he said to him, follow me. He'd already said, follow me. God's going to say to you again, afresh, after your failure, sorry, now follow me in my strength, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Follow me with me equipping you, me guiding you, me leading you, and it's going to be a different story. God is going to give you a different story. It's not going to end in failure. It's going to end with you. Or Peter just wanted to glorify God, but the problem is you cannot glorify God in your own strength, and you don't have to do it alone. Let me just give you a quick story from my own life just to help illustrate it. When I, got, when I became a Christian, I was so excited because my life was so broken, my heart was so broken, and I had all these promises, God is going to change my life, God is going to help me, God is going to rescue me. In the first year that I became a Christian, I did something that completely almost crippled me spiritually. And I mean, I won't go into what it was, but it was something that wounded my heart so much. And I did not know how I was going to get get through it. It got so bad that I was, I was just weeping, you know, because I felt God's call on my life. I felt God was going to use my life. I felt I was part of Jesus' plan. And all of a sudden, at that moment, I thought, I've, I've ruined it. And I remember we were at uh, like, a, um, like a Weber Spoons or whatever, eating food. We had the food together. And I was so broken. I couldn't even be with the people next to me. I went out into the car park and I was just crying. You know, I was just crying before the Lord. And I remember looking at a uh, on a field, there was a horse in that field, and when this horse went into another field, it would just sit there in mud. And it's mo when the horse was just moving its legs like that in mud. Yeah? And I was just weeping, and I, I you know, don't always get this, but I felt the Lord speak to me and say, um, that's you, that's you. And I thought, I'm crying, and the Lord saying, that's you. I felt the Lord would say, you give me instruction, that's, that's you. And I didn't think any of, it, any of it. You know, I thought, maybe it's just me thinking that. But I, did, I went to church the next day, and the pastor spoke a sermon, and he spoke the very story. He says, you've failed, you've messed up, you've, you've done wrong, and you think it's over. And he, and he gave that illustration. He says, you're like a horse stuck in mud. And the problem is of a horse stuck in mud, he says, the more it tries to move, if you get a horse stuck in sinking sand, the more it tries to move, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and, deeper, and you can't get out of it. That's what was Peter. He's going deeper and deeper and deeper, and he can't get out of it. Your only way to get out of it is God has to come and rescue you and deliver you. And I, I settled it. I'm not going to try and get myself out of this. I want to get out of it. God, deliver me. God, you know, I don't, you know, like back like the prodigal son, just make me a hired servant. Do whatever you want in my life. I just want to have your presence again. I want to have that love again. And praise God, he did restore me and did strengthen me. And I'll tell you another story, you might think this is weird, but I'll tell you another story that, that connect. On holiday the other week, I've, we were on a holiday, and there was, in the back of this holiday, there's horses, they've got like these six or seven horses, and the lady that owns these horses, she said they're just like pets, and they're running, and they're thingy, and there was a, um, you know, and I was going up to pray at that night time, and just praying to the Lord, and again, I felt the Lord say, that's you, that was, that was 15 years ago, but this horse wasn't, wasn't going in the mud sinking. This horse was, was, was loving it in the field and, and, and skipping and, and, and free. And it's like God's speaking to you saying, I can restore you. You look at Peter weeping in denial. You look at Peter in the book of Acts and he stands up filled with the Holy Spirit with boldness and he preaches and he's able to prophesy and, and use the scriptures with the book of Joel. 
and tells them what is happening and 3,000 people get converted, isn't it? Your failure is not yet the end. And God wants to lead you. And we can say, well, be like Acts, be like 1 Peter, 2 Peter. But God can't do it in, until he starts healing your heart and he wants to heal your heart. So let him do it. Just stop trying to do it yourself. You can't fix your own heart. You can't do it. But God can and he's going to restore you. So let's, let's pray now and ask the Lord that you do a miracle. What an amazing miracle is that he heals your broken heart. But you've got to let him do it. Father God, thank you. I, Lord, I know, Lord, there's people in this room with broken hearts, Lord God. I know that. Lord, you knew that when you, you said those scriptures that you've come to heal the broken hearted, Lord God. And I just pray for people in this room that they're just like Peter. They've broke down and they've wept. But I pray that you restore them. Lord, I pray that you get your healing right where the pain is. You get your, the word of God right back to where the pain is. And the word that you restore and you give a hope and you give a future into their lives, Lord God, that that word would penetrate deep into their heart, that they would know that they're restored. They might not feel worthy of it. We never do, Lord, but they know that they're restored. You know you've spoken it. You know you've addressed that issue. Just like with Peter, you addressed it head on because you, you asked him three times. And you deal with it head on. You make it like it's, there's no mistake. You're dealing with it. Just like that situation with me with the horses back then and back now, Lord, we connect the dots. We connect the dots from our failure to your love, to your restoration. And I just pray for, for people in this room that they've come to you. They're not going to say, I'm going to do it by myself. They've come to you and they're saying, God, I'm going to let you begin to heal my heart. But part of that is a journey. Part of that is, you know, we can see, fully see Peter's hearts restored and acts in one Peter and two Peter. And it'll be a journey for them. But Lord God, I pray that you work that into their heart. By your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to get together and sing our last song.